those lives on board the Akagi and all of these vessels. Incredible bravery by thousands and thousands of men. Yeah, to uplift and to share and do those stories justice is really what all of this information that we're gathering will help us to move forward with, help us to understand better, and help us to piece together these parts of history. Do you want to zoom in on that? Zoom, please. Zoom in. All right. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. What is that, Hans? Well. Trying to make it out. Not sure. <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> Thank you for the zoom. All right, zoom back out. Go now. When you look at the cross sections <laughs> of the Akagi, you know the the uh, sides were, you know, quite thick. It wasn't that the hangar went all the way to the side of the hull, but there were spaces for all kinds of storage and and structural elements that held up the deck. So that's that member may have been the inside wall of the upper hangar, with spaces behind it towards the out the outer hull. So this is where it, it was split. When we were going down the uh, starboard side there, this is where it was split apart. Oh, like thank you, Robert. The back was broken right here. Was that from one of the tor torpedo strikes, you mean? Yeah, when we came down the starboard side, you could see where the plate had been blown out. Oh, there. right. And the whole thing was like the... That's right, Robert, yeah. The right. front quarter of the ship was split off. To all of our friends uh, watching online with us at Nautilus Live or the stream to Silver Spring, colleagues in Japan, folks watching on YouTube, we're, we're about to go through a shift change in the next five to 10 minutes. So just wanna say mahalo to everyone for tuning in, mahalo to everyone in the van, all of our team uh, for continuing this exploration and, and uh, entering into this um, sacred space together. Um, this is Daniel Kinzer. I'm science communication fellow on board and uh, be signing off, signing off shortly. But uh, here we are, center line of uh, the flight deck, looking down into the hangar at times, coming up soon on some of the significant damage from a bomb that hit the flight deck uh, just aft of where we are currently. So IGN Akagi, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to everyone ashore for all of your help and your stories perspective. Mahalo nui. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Can we zoom there? Yep. Yeah. We zoom in, Amber. All right. Thank you. Ooh, that's good. Okay. All, right. All right. So yeah, we have. Uh, we're going to start changing out the uh, watch about now. Um, there's approximately seven hours left uh, in the dive, so we will continue through uh, the night and uh, uh, begin uh, uh, working our way toward our uh, our next dive. Um, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. If the diagrams I'm looking at are correct, you know, the inside of the hangars had, you know, some elevated catwalks 
along the interior wall of the hangar. And I thought maybe we glimpsed a part of that on the port side. But diagrams are one thing and, and reality is sometimes different. <laughs> Video watch change. All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and continuing to uh, explore uh, this morning, evening, or whatever time it is with you, um, with us here on the EV Nautilus. Um, again, we are looking at uh, Akagi and just continuing to go down the midline of the ship. We are just doing a watch change, so um, as things get situated, we're just gonna uh, make sure all operations are running smoothly and then we'll um, continue our chat.
Ja. Das. Oh no, this is good. Just let We'll stand by, just let me know when we're ready. Yeah, we're just uh, ironing out some details with the cooler, the chiller. Roger. C can we do a zoom now or, or wait a couple minutes? Yeah, sorry, Hans. I didn't. I didn't hear you. I was just. Uh, I wanted to turn to the right here and uh, see what that sonar target was. Make sure I'm not uh, going by and overhanging something. Roger. We've gone down that side though, and there was no uh, traps. I haven't been on that side. Around here. I was on the starboard side, but I'm not aware of any obstructions or traps. There is partial partial island that we're coming up on the yeah. starboard side, which would be as we're facing the stern, that would be to the right. Yeah, I'm looking to the right right now. Yeah, so, so we're not quite there yet. I think we've just crossed over the forward elevator making yeah. our way down the center line. What did you want to zoom on? Well, didn't turn out to be that interesting. Now, it looked like a door, but it's just a piece of structural debris. But it looks like this is the next elevator. If we've crossed over one and we're come across rounded corners here, this would be the one more mid time, please, man. Ship's elevator, the oh second God. of three, I'm not getting it. and that means just to the right should be the remnants of the port side the island. Or no, this is the one next to the island. I is think it is. Yeah. Is that where we are? So yeah, yeah we're the that's right. We're right by the island, which we want to look. We want to take a look down at. So. Yeah. We also, so Hans. This is also the area where, you know, we're in the area where Dick Best planted that bomb. Yeah, that's my understanding. In fact, the stern, the, the, the aft edge of the elevator, and it looks like we're picking up a big gap back there. Yeah. But we also wanted to inspect the island from this side, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm impressed that this section is in as good of shape as it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1,000-pound bombs. For, uh, yeah. Can we turn to the right, 45 degrees, Dan? Yeah. 45 degrees starboard, Roger. For a glimpse, we think we're close to the island, or what's left of it. I think you are, too. That's a uh, sonar, hard sonar target there. Yeah, I don't know if we can tip the camera up at all. We can, but... Um, we'll lose the light sphere, yeah. right? Yeah. You can see the dark band there on the top of the... You're better off if I, uh, if I lift the vehicle up a little bit. We can... Um, we might catch it then, yeah. Yeah, you, get, you can see out a little bit further with the... Uh, Not a lot further, but you can see it back there into the gloomy depths. But I don't think we're going to... That's 20 meters away. I'm lighting it up, probably 15 meter, meters away. 
Making stuff over that way, certainly. But yeah, if we can use the thrusters a bit. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, I don't want to deviate from our, you know, that that's going to take a, a long time if we change the Let course. Let me see. So. Um, <clears throat> so from what I've been playing around with it so far, if I use the thrusters and then turn real quick before it swings back, <laughs> you get a glimpse. So we'll, we'll try that. Well, this is an important area to us as well, this, this aft edge of the elevator. Yeah, Hans, I'd, the priority is to assess, you know, this area in, in terms of the area of the bomb hit. We've seen the island. It would be good to see it again. Okay. But looking at the bomb damage is priority one for us. Yep, right. Roger. So we can turn back and look towards the stern back on our heading. Problem with the thrusters is that maybe not a good idea. I'm going to turn those off on. Uh, so thrusting around in here is going to uh, stir up the silt on you. Ah, uh, okay. That was uh, not a lot of thrust there, and you can see the result. So. No, well, the thrust, the, <coughs> the silt will hang around for quite a while. I, I doubt it. There's a lot of current down here. Hmm. Save me one more time, and I give up. While we're waiting for the silt to settle down, do you guys want to do introductions? That would be great, yeah. Um, if everything is looking stable, navigation and ROV-wise, um, thanks for the update, Mia. Uh, so again, this is the 12 to 4 watch. Uh, glad to be here with you all, um, looking at me. this historical moment in such a wonderful community of um, scientists and archaeologists and historians and um, other experts. Well, I'm Kara again. Um, I'm serving as a science communication fellow, but um, typically when I'm not on the EV Nautilus, I uh, work as the seagrass and mangrove conservation coordinator as part of the Guam Coral Reef Initiative. Uh, so uh, here to help just um, share some uh, basic uh, stories uh, about uh, what we're looking at and give some context and uh, looking forward to spending yeah. the next few hours I'm with you. I'll pass that along to my colleague to the right. Thanks Kara and Ali. Hello everyone. My name is Elsa Tale and I am here on the exploration vessel Nautilus as a supporting scientist. So I'm here to assist in uh, multiple roles, such as communications, um, storytelling, and also with various lab and data logging work. When I'm not on the vessel, I'm a researcher at the Palau International Coral Reef Center. And I'm just happy and honored to be here um, witnessing this exploration as we uh, see this vessel um, in a new light for the first time. The war has left its um, remnants all over the Pacific, including in Palau. Um, so it's just a very humbling experience to be here. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. So Dan, if there's any way we can slowly, um, you know, just reorient to facing aft, then we'd, then we'd be slowly moving out of the silt. But uh, yeah, yeah. And we yeah. can pause introductions while uh, we get a closer look here. Yeah, I think we want to be back doing what we were doing on center line, facing our heading. And we were beginning to look like we picked up some mm -hmm. image of damage. That's all damage. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. Little, little to the right again. Yeah, we're over the elevator. If we can twist, turn a little to the right. Hans, the way that's curved and whatnot almost looks like what happens with high levels of heat and softening of the metal. Yeah. yeah. So right there is the, you know, aft edge of the elevator where the flight deck is broken and tumbled down and we're looking at the location aren't we Jim yes yeah yeah we're pretty close to where that thousand pound bomb dropped by Dick Best uh, punched through and they were refueling getting ready uh, all those aircraft down there lit off an inferno in the hangar deck that consumed the Kagi Flames were so intense it trapped the engineering guys below. The admiral and his staff had to climb I wrote, out of the island and, and make their way forward. The captain actually tied himself to the supports at the bow with others as they took shelter. His plan was to sit out the fire and go down with the ship. Uh, that the level of damage we're seeing here and the type of buckling we're seeing the rest is consistent with you know just what we've been talking about the formed metal that yeah unlike soften heat unlike the forward areas this damage extends way down into the interior yeah, we were looking I mean, at the. Look at this. Yeah. No, absolutely, Hans. This is. I've done a 360 rotation there, so I'm looking aft now. I'm looking south. So that makes sense, son. So, looking back the way we are come, we came from that direction. South is isn't the bow oriented south? I believe the stern. So we're at the yep. elevator. Yep. Yep. We came from that direction. You're right. Yeah, that was a good view, Dan. I'm gonna just tilt the camera straight down here for a second while we're over the. Great. That'd be perfect. Well, almost straight down. I get a better view down there in, into the uh, what's directly below us. So we're uh, rotating now, counterclockwise back to our zero fire. Excuse me, 045 heading, which is the direction the Nautilus is moving. To answer your question, Hans, uh, it looks like we are heading northeast. Right. Yeah, okay. Northerly towards the stern. Yep. I'm going to tilt the camera back up here again. We're. Uh, as we say, breathing a little bit, so we're you know disturbing the sediment a little as we heave up and down here. And just noting, we had a comment from a Japanese viewer expressing their gratitude for um, exploring this site and sharing this with the world. And uh, we also want to just thank you for tuning in. Um, we, ha we have viewers from all over the world, Japan, UK, Australia, Ireland, Finland, Germany, Poland, uh, the Philippines, New Zealand, Norway, Italy, Czech Republic, and Canada. So 
um, thank you so much. And especially um, for our Japanese viewer, this has been a collaboration between uh, archaeologists um, in Japan and within Japanese universities. So um, it's definitely um, something that has been a shared expertise um, and a very much t a result of teamwork. We'll just have to wait a moment to get out of the silt. Yeah, yeah. I would. I think I would advise uh, against uh, using the thrusters. Yep. There, as we. Uh, and according to my waypoints from when we first touched down, this is pretty close. Uh, we came down a little bit more north, but this is where I marked waypoint two as we started this uh, dive. Right. Then we'll proceed. Uh, perhaps while we're waiting uh, to get through the silt, we can continue our watch change introductions. Uh, Upashana, would you like to yeah. introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Upashana. Uh, I am a deep sea biologist uh, studying the evolution of a certain group of deep sea octocorals. And I yeah. am the biologist uh, of this watch. And it has been a very humbling experience being a part of these di last few dives uh, and being able to be in the same room as everybody else while we uh, discover and make our way through uh, these shipwrecks and I'm learning a lot from everybody here and on shore as well and with this I'll pass on to Hans. Thank you. Hans van Tilburg, I'm a maritime archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Taylor Ann? Hello, my name is Taylor Ann. I am the science manager and data logger. Um, and when I'm not on the Nautilus, I am a researcher and um, project manager at UCLA. Um, and I'm really honored to be here, a part of this historical moment, um, hoping that families find some closure um, and understanding from all of the discoveries we have today. Thank you so much. Um, all our valuable team members really appreciate your time and also appreciate your introductions for our new viewers. Uh, moving on to our first row, uh, Jaina, would you be able to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Aloha. My name is Jaina Galvez. I am originally from Hilo, Hawaii, and when I'm um, I currently reside in Seattle, Washington, and when I'm not on the Nautilus, I am a filmmaker. Um, echoing what everybody else said, very honored to be here. Um, and I'll pass it on to my right. Thank you. Hola, my name is Jacob Westling, and uh, I'm from Ever Beach, Hoi. Uh, I, when I'm not on the Nautilus, I I am a scientist at the Megalab, the Multi-Scale Environmental Graphical Analysis Lab in Hilo, Hawaii. Thank you. Blessed to be here. Hi, good morning. I'm Dan with the ROV team. Uh, grateful, humble, and excited to be here. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Good morning or afternoon and evening for everyone. I'm Mia. I'm serving as a navigator on this cruise. It's my second time on Nautilus. Um, and I'm also humbled to be here. And for the rest of the team's awareness, uh, I just put in a move two minutes ago for two zero meters at a bearing of 035 when I didn't want to interrupt your uh, introductions. Hi. Thanks so much. Up back down here again, Hans. They seem to be uh, <coughs> and it looks like lack of a better word, giant hole but beneath us. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking at a huge gap in the sonar gap data. Better word, yes. 
aft of the island, it just is opened up. So that answers the question of why we're not seeing flight deck. Are we here? We're just aft or of that midship's elevator. So here? The Further here. left. Got it. Okay. And, and all that flight deck is gone. All right. Looks like uh, <clears throat> there's a gap in the uh, lower structure there too, maybe. Yeah, it's possible that uh, the flight deck is gone and uh, the deck to the upper hangar is gone. We're beginning to see some deck. Maybe it's to the lower hangar. Not sure. But we see structural elements lower down in the ship. Yeah. Deck beams, they look broken. You think Atalanta will fit through that hole? Concern the all this visibility, but I'm thinking we drop down for a peak at least here. <coughs> Started here, I think. Uh, the risk is we disturb the visibility for the overall picture but we might get a glimpse down into yeah. the into the lower deck there. We're headed this way. We're on top. Yeah, I don't think it's advisable to go down there. Oh yeah, we concur. No guts, no glory. I lead a peaceful domestic life, Dan. Uh. Wow. I can drop down a little bit if you if you're all right with that. I'm all right with a little bit. Baby steps. Yeah, and uh, we sh we finished the ship movement, but now we're just waiting for uh, Atalanta to catch up. Um, Mia, is this a good time, or do we have uh, some time here to open it up to um, reintroductions from our uh, onshore team? Um, I think so, yeah. If we need to pause, we'll, we'll pause, so. Okay, sounds good. Uh, feel free to interrupt um, as needed. Uh, onshore team, uh, would you like to remind um, our, or reintroduce yourself to our uh, viewers who may be joining uh, for the first time. That looks this good. This is there. Dr. James Bogato. I am the Senior Vice President of Search Inc., the, one of the largest cultural resource companies in the United States, former Director of Maritime Heritage for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and uh, I am the onshore archaeology lead, along with Bill Hartmeyer from NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. Bill is just stepped away. Uh, we are focusing, you know, right now in this area, in the spot where the fatal bomb hit took place that ultimately lead to the loss of Bukagi. And so as we pause and look at this and as the dust clears a bit, it's now my pleasure to turn this over to my colleague Frank Thompson from the Navy History and Heritage Committee. 
Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Frank Thompson. I'm the Acting Assistant Director for Collection Management for Naval History and Heritage Command. We oversee the Underwater Archaeology Program for the U.S. Navy and, and Submerged Cultural Resources. And we uh, have a far-reaching responsibility for military wrecks um, that are around the world. And so it's been a pleasure to be part of this survey of Yorktown and Akagi and, um, and Taga. On a personal note, uh, I was part of the 2019 survey that located the wrecks of Kaga and Akagi. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here for the next step in the survey of these wrecks. Wow, thank you for sharing that, um, especially uh, being on that original team in 2019, it must be um, a very meaningful moment to return uh, back to the site and get more footage um, now in 2023. Uh, we do have a lot of viewers who are sending in their comments, um, expressing their appreciation, um, expressing uh, other feelings of um, gratitude or closure or um, feelings that this footage is bringing. So um, very glad that if this can give any closure or um, uh, meaning to all the history and memorialize all the um, lives that were lost here. Short team, do you know the direction that Dick Best was headed when he dropped the thousand pound bomb? Because if it came in at that aft edge, would the majority of the, the force head towards the stern? Because this is where the huge open gap is. It's interesting, Hans. Remember, the, with these dive bomb attacks, uh, he is literally flying straight into of a sky filled with red hot flak, uh, you know, and, and you know, and shells are just screaming past him. He he evaded all of that and lined up, and then and then dropped that thousand pound bomb. Uh, practically, I mean, what do you think, Frank? Practically, just heading straight down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, he's a, he's, heading, he's he's in a dive bomber, so you are heading in a steep dive. At, uh, at very rapid speed, and you know you're being your plane is being shaken by flat going off around you. You're trying to concentrate and um, you know, aim your bomb at the same time. Uh, you know it's, it's you know who knows what was going to what this uh, was in best mind at that time. I mean, just it was it must have been just an overwhelmingly frightening and exhilarating experience, I would say. Obviously, he would be at an angle. The angle would be acute, but he would be at an angle as well because he needs to pull out, be able to pull out. and come up over that deck. Yeah. He's probably pulling significant G-forces at that point, too. Yes. But uh, he comes in, pulls off, and then heads out and around the, the pickets, all of whom are shooting at it. He's taking fire from the mostly from the support vessels, not from the carrier itself, because its guns can't. He was uh, taking a heavy everywhere. amount of everywhere. Everybody was shooting at him, but I. Uh, we've already seen anti-aircraft weapons pointing straight up, um, you know, it's likely you know at at him and the others. But I mean, some of those the weapons we looked at at the start of the dive, one that was headed straight up that. Or the, or the carrier's the guns. The last that we've been shooting at would have been best. 
the carrier itself had a limited angle on its uh, any aircraft guns or just its big guns? Anti-aircraft guns, you know, were meant, you know, they would have some angle on them, but they're shooting practically straight up. I, I think we're still looking down past the deck of the upper hangar into the lower hangar at least. Yes. That's an immense amount I of think damage. You're, I think you're right. Some of it's blast damage, but the majority of the damage we're going to be seeing is also going to be from the fire, the, the hot, burning, extensive fire yeah. that swept through, fueled by exploding planes and gasoline. Yeah, and we've gone about 15 meters from that 20 meter call. Thanks. We're continuing out. Continuing. We were. We've been going 035 for the bearing. Is that the orientation of the vessel 035? You think? For the most part. As we head in the uh, straight down the center, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jim, I don't know if I ever told you this, but when I was young, the person that taught my father and, and myself, if I ever listened in, to sail was a man named Pete Conyers. And he was an aviator in World War II, and he flew the SBD Dauntlesses. And I remember him telling us that it was a terrifying experience to go through one of those dives. Wow, yeah. One of my professors, was a naval aviator who fought through the war. He was uh, an enlisted man. He had the back seat, uh, and he really it was just an unbelievable experience for Ted. I also remember talking to some Japanese pilots, including you know fighter pilots, uh, who had been there at Pearl Harbor back at the time when we had the 50th anniversary. And uh, that also included the torpedo bomb guys. And all of these pilots had, I think, a respect for the, the danger that they were facing, but also a certain, uh, I'm searching for the right words here, but what would be would be. They, they, they flew. They did this, and uh, if they paused, they might not have, you know, like taken that dive bomb, lined up, and flown straight at a vessel and launched the torpedo for the rest on on both sides. I think you're never really aware of what you're capable of doing until you're in the midst of it, and that, that trial by fire, literally. I think for best, most likely just keeping a cool head, focusing on what he was doing, as opposed to thinking about consequences, I'm going to get hit or not. He's moving his aircraft, he's diving, he's readying, he's the guy behind him is shouting out the altitude. And those dives are about 70 degrees. Yeah. And just the visibility and the effect she forces on your body and maintaining that focus. Incredible to imagine. <clears throat> and there literally is red hot stuff just flying up at you. For the team's reference, we're pretty close to where we first came down for the first sighting. And then we ended up, we shifted uh, towards the starboard side where we saw those gun tubs. Um, right. For those who have been here the whole time. No, I, thanks for that. We were looking at it and figuring that we were somewhere close to that. Because yes, after we turned, we went right on over to the tubs and to the anti-aircraft tubs. I think we're, we're content with coming back up and continuing to move. 
Roger. Are you uh, okay with another move, Dan? Two zero meters, uh, zero three five. Are you good, Hans? Let's do it. Bridge nab. So Hans, uh, I had a question. So after the ship was hit, uh, how long after Can we move that to zero did meters it finally at a start of zero three five? Do we have any information about that? It was about Thank you. ten thirty in the morning mm -hmm. when the the strike hit the Akagi, the thousand pound bomb was dropped right down the close to the elevator and it started igniting the fires and the fire some of the fire pumps you know were put out of action uh they couldn't ex extinguish the fires eventually had to uh, abandon ship but it wasn't until the next morning when the decision was made to scuttle the ship so akagi was still afloat early the next morning in the darkness probably still burning when and it was clear that they can't save the ship and so the flagship received one torpedo each from four Japanese destroyers. And there's, you know, that sounds something of a, a ceremonial action yeah. to me that's, that's quite touching. Absolutely. And that's what sank the vessel in the early hours of the following morning, three, four o'clock, I'm not sure exactly what it was. So I don't, I don't think I can keep going. And just to confirm my understanding, Hans, by scuttling you mean they purposely sank it so that um, it wouldn't fall into enemy hands potentially? That's right. Is that a common practice to sink one's own vessels when it was beyond, uh, when they were beyond the position to rescue it? Yes, I think it seems to be. And also, so for some more context, um, we are talking about the 1,000 pound bomb that really caused such severe damage. Um, this was just one very large bomb, correct? Not multiple bombs that um, added up to a thousand? Just one. Yeah, is that, was that typical or was that a very special particular bomb on this particular, um, on a particular aircraft? That's the main ordinance that the uh, Dauntless dive bombers could drop. They could drop 500 pound bombs, smaller bombs, a thousand pound bombs. I don't know if they could do anything bigger than that. Gotcha, thank you. And uh, I was also looking into this some more uh, between watches and um, I saw one source that kind of mentioned that um, uh, planes from the Enterprise um, headed to two different aircraft carriers and actually only a few planes headed towards Akagi, um, resulting in this one uh, plane dropping that 1,000 pound bomb. Is that true that uh, the Air Force, attacking Air Force from the Enterprise was split? That's right. The uh, squadrons were attacking Kaga, and when they saw that Kaga had received a significant amount of damage, there are three that pulled off and chose the next target of opportunity. Wow. And one of those was uh, best, right? That's right. Did he also hit the Kaga or Saru? Was he one of the few, one of the pilots that hit two targets? 
I don't know that. He would have had one 1,000-pound bomb to drop. He did sink two carriers. He was... Uh... Um, I think it was Vic Best who got the hit on the Akagi. He also later scored one of the hits on Hear You later in the afternoon. Right, after rearming, refueling. Yeah. And there was there was also two, the, the two near misses of Akagi were both 1,000-pound mm -hmm. bombs. Yeah. Going back to the question... Yeah, going back to the question about the, the bombers from Enterprise, um, there were three U.S. carriers, Enterprise, Yorktown, and Hornet, um, when the, the torp there was supposed to be a coordinated attack um, going in, uh, but the, the torpedo planes, being that they were slower, got separated, the launch didn't go very well, so the groups left at different times. Uh, some of them got, some of them missed the target because they got the wrong information, didn't didn't make contact with the fleet. The first unit to attack were the torpedo squadrons, and they were, those planes were so grossly obsolete that uh, they had no real defense against the Japanese uh, carrier fighter cover, um, and so they were slaughtered. Um, but it also drew. Uh, the, the fighters down to sea level so that when the dive bombers from Enterprise and, and Yorktown arrived over in separate separate formations, there was no counter to them, but uh, they were unaware of where each other were. They lost uh, contact with each other, but so what turned out to be a coordinated attack was a pure accident that, because neither side, neither squadron knew the other one was there until the until they hit the, the carriers. And it was just one of those freak accidents and, and luck. Hornet bombers unfortunately did not make uh, contact at all um, and played no part in that that uh, that particular uh, segment of the battle. So um, you know the first ones to be hit were uh, were the were Kaga, Kagi and Soryu um, and you know, her, her, here you escape because she was operating a little further away from them at that time. What's that? No, no, it's up to the bridge. Yeah, I don't want to change heading while we're moving down the center. That will kick us off. <clears throat> And just adding on to that uh, detail you um, you just provided, and thank you very much for those further breakdown of the events that happened. Um, is it true that all of this occurred in a pretty short time frame? All uh, three carriers were bombed um, and uh, sustained significant damage and were on fire within um, a very small time frame? Yes. Well, we're finally past the majority of that gap. That was impressive expanse. And now we're picking up remnants of the flight deck again, I believe. As we look at the chart, Hans, for those of us who have them, um, Approximately, where are we? From the bird's eye view? I would say we're three quarters of the way from bow to stern, and we're still forward of the aft elevator. Roger. So maybe halfway between the what's left of the island and the aft elevator. Have we gone past all those larger guns, uh, gun bear, um, <coughs> tubs on the side? I think we're just passing them now. Okay. I didn't see the lower 20 millimeter, uh, 20 centimeter casemate guns that are so low to the water line. I was pretending like I was getting rest. Is that a swimming holothuria? Yes, that's a swimming sea cucumber. 
and the Miastas. I haven't seen that before. We can see the heavy steel mesh that underlaid the wooden deck just itself peeled up and warped. Are you saying that peeled backwards and forward or from uh, like closing a lid almost? Uh, I would imagine, you know, the, the bomb hit or induced explosions pushing that upward. Upasana, does it look like there's significant um, like sediment deposition on this frame? Would that prevent a uh, settlement of creatures like anemones or um, other sessile organisms that like to attach to substrates? Uh, yes, it looks like there's a subsequent amount of sediment uh, and bacterial mat that has uh, covered this part of the wreck, but I'm honestly not sure how that would affect the settlement of anemones. We have, we were seeing a uh, higher number of anemones earlier during our previous watch, but I was also wondering why we aren't seeing more of them. But it could be a f fact, there can be lots of factors, and also we have to remember that this part of a ship was. Uh, exposed to a bombing attack and was burning for a while so any of the chemicals that could have uh, remained as a result of the fire can also be deterrent to the settlement of uh, anemones uh, that's just a hypothesis that I was thinking about I am not sure and I'm not I can look that up how that affects but uh, metals wood being on fire would ch definitely change the chemical composition of all of those uh, and that can be a factor right that makes sense like i'm sure there are all sorts of different compounds there that uh, could potentially either deter settlement or harm creatures and i believe on i'm not sure at this time but uh, uh, boat uh, ships also had special paints or coatings specifically to prevent uh, creatures from settling on them. Okay. Yeah, uh, those anti-fouling paints, but they have been used, uh, I think, for a very long amount of time. Mm -hmm. And oh, and that paint over time uh, degrades. And even then we see, we do see settlements of organisms. But you're right, we don't know how that paint, what happens to the molecular composition of the paint once it burns and once it has been on fire for so long. So uh, I would imagine that if it hadn't burned for so long, the anti-fouling paint probably would have degraded or washed away by now and allowing right. recruits. But this is something that I was also wondering, but I'm not sure wh yeah, why. There's just so little yes. research on it. Yeah. Yes. And even if there is, I am not well versed or aware of it, but mm -hmm. I can try and look up. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, to any viewers who are unfamiliar with the term anti-fouling paint, fouling means the growth of creatures like barnacles and um, mussels and other small organisms that will attach to the surface of a vessel and this can um, cause issues especially with uh, drag in the water uh, as the vessels try to move through the water it can um, cause the 
uh, ship to use a lot more fuel because it has to deal with all the drag. So um, there are paints and other technologies like making the hull very smooth to prevent the settlement of creatures on uh, the vessel. We've gone about 13 meters from that last call. Thanks. We're going to continue our way towards the stern. Do you want me to put in another call? Yes, please. Are you ready, Dan? Bridge nav. Can we please step two zero meters bearing zero three five degrees? Thank you. It's quite a ways, but can we try a zoom down into that hole then? Sure, go ahead, Jana. Still this far aft, it damaged down multiple decks. Are we now aft of the most aft elevator, or are we over the elevator currently, this hole? I don't know that we've got to the elevator yet. No, not yet, okay. I think but, you know, to me, this says induced explosions from the lower hangar as well as the upper hangar. But I'm looking at the, the sonar pattern, and it still looks like we have that narrow elevator-shaped box in front of us past this gap. Uh-oh. Thank you. You can go wide. Oh, that's better. Yeah, you can see the internal walls of, of the uh, the hangar areas and the space behind them between the hangars and the and the hull for other compartments. Is that hole up on the upper left one of the hangar compartments? Is that where you're saying, Hans? Yeah. Yeah, right there. Yeah. And that's all hangar in there. And in the same configuration, probably on the other side. As originally built, remember, this lower deck in the hangar was a flight deck. And so planes would come flying out of there, which is hard to imagine.
was that before it was retrofitted or did they have two decks to fly out of during the Battle of Midway? They had the single upper main flight deck at the Battle of Midway. It, it, it wasn't an idea that would work for the larger, heavier aircraft that were being developed. Um, so, Hans, I believe so far on this dive, we've kind of gone around the edge of this vessel and now we're going down the midline. Is that a pretty standard practice for marine archaeological surveys? Well, given that most archaeological surveys aren't done on World War II aircraft carriers, yes. Or other ships, I guess, if uh, shipwrecks are... Um, have any kind of standard procedure. I guess they're, each one is so unique, though, they probably have their own dive plan. Yeah, suited to its conditions and environment, of course, and visibility and the platform you're using. But certainly in this case, to make a perimeter survey is a prudent measure to become as aware as you can be of any type of entanglements or hang-ups or lines that are floating in the water. I, in, in line to what uh, Carol just asked, I think we have another maybe seven, eight hours of the dive left on bottom. So is there, how are we planning to utilize that time? What other parts of the ship do we want to have a look at? How much time do we have left? Uh, I think around eight hour on bottom. I'm not exactly sure. Mm. Uh, Tilran, uh, I think off bottom is... Yeah, I think we're Around coming seven, off bottom at 7 a.m. 7, so that is... Uh, six hours. Six hours, yes. Well, the plan is to continue to the stern, mm -hmm. and we'll have completed the overhead pass. Okay. Then at that point, we'll have a discussion with, uh, with NAV, mm -hmm. because we're going to move to the vessel's starboard side into the debris field, which okay. is a little ways away, probably 60 or 70 yes. meters outboard 
from the starboard side and we want to do some passes over the debris field out there. Yes, because we were seeing a lot of debris on the starboard side. That's right. On the sonar. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, science uh, can confirm. So we'll we'll have a bottom time till seven o'clock a.m. So six more hours of die time. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and if, if anyone would like to see that sonar view as well. Um, it is showing in our quad cam, so on nautiluslive.org, we have a few different channels, uh, and our uh, if you click on the quad channel, it will show uh, multiple screens, including um, the sonar. And again, on our uh, YouTube page, it is also um, the quad stream is available as well. Um, so just looking at this sonar image, you can see how uh, this can be kind of a difficult operation, um, just navigating around uh, all these structures with the ship and Atalanta and avoiding any uh, entanglements. So uh, just taking a while to be extra cautious here. Shore team, just for an orientation check, I've been looking at a straight edge in the lower, uh, well, upper or lower hangar deck, and I think we're in the area close to the forward edge of the aft elevator. Do you think that's the position we're in? Yeah, Hans, I mean, to our, to our reconnoitering, yeah, looks good. Yeah, there's so much not left of the flight deck, you know, it's hard to see any other features, but uh, it was a fairly straight edge. I, th I think we're just getting to the aft elevator. Uh, we have a question here in the chat. How many lives were lost on this ship? Um, unfortunately, 267 of Akagi's crew uh, were lost when it sank. Uh, the question also is asking, how long did it take to sink? And were there any survivors, any uh, personal accounts afterwards? Um, I'm not sure about that one. Um, Hans or archaeology team, could you uh, offer some insight? Yeah, just a minor point. The uh, 267 of the uh, Kagi sailors were lost in the explosions and the attack and the fires. Uh, but by the time the ship was going to be scuttled, everybody had evacuated. All survivors had gotten off the ship. Uh, sorry, SPL, can I cut in? Um, so we're uh, we've, ran, we've finished that move, the 20 meter move. Um, the temperature is also rising in the van, so I just want to, uh, you know, keep us moving in case we need to abort the dive or, or something. Um, um, are you ready for another mm. two zero move? Yes, we're continuing down the midline towards the stern. Okay. Yeah.
All right, so we're, I just put in the call for two zero meters, continuing the bearing of 035. Phil, on the shore team, can you fill me in on the condition of the aft deck? Was uh, the flight deck, you know, that's elevated on the pillars all missing back there and all clear down to the cruiser fantail? Yes, it appeared all the flight deck structure aft was missing. So we're just getting we to that point. No yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're we just... saw no evidence of, uh, of the supports. Right. So we're getting to the point where the the enclosed hangars will end, the, the pillars are gone, the flight deck is gone, and it'll be nothing left but the, the fantail, the deck of the cruiser. Hans, were you saying that we, uh, did we pass that elevator shaft? Yeah, I think we're just over it now and getting ready to pass it. I, I would guess that the bulkhead we're looking at is, you know, the end of the elevator or or we've already gone a little bit past it and it's the end of the enclosed hangars. I'm not sure. Okay, roger. Is it um, documented whether that um, superstructure was consumed in the overnight fire and gone before it was scuttled, or do you think that was became uh, <coughs> detached in the and on the way down? That's a good question. Um, you know, I understand that the explosions and induced explosions blew out the forward bulkhead of the hangars that may have happened here at this end too i'm not sure were there any vertical obstructions seen at, on the the aft deck phil shore side um we didn't see any yeah no i mean there, they weren't there but we didn't notice them you know starboard starboard quarter there's a whole mess of stuff yeah um, but as far as any hangs that are on, you know, on the stern deck itself, yeah. um, the hangar deck pretty much abruptly ends and then peters okay. off. Yeah, thank you. So uh, you guys saw most of the pillars were missing, so the structure supporting the pillars is... Right. Correct. Those four large supports um, that you see holding up the flight deck, we couldn't locate those. Um, the starboard quarter, like I said, maybe or, or just off forward of starboard stern, forward of starboard quarter. Uh, they may be in that debris field, but there's a, quite a bit of clay rise in that section as well. But um, you know, no immediate danger from where where the ROV is flying right. going this direction. Were you guys able to identify on any of the earlier watches the that stack that we talked about? The stack, the... Um, the smokes, I think Mike called it a smoke stack. Oh yeah, well that that I think is, is gone. gone. There's a hole where it came out the uh, starboard side. Well, they were vertical, or they were uh, horizontal stacks, I believe. They came out horizontally. Yeah. As we keep moving, was there anything you've seen, Hans? I know you've been on the watch for a long time that really surprised you? Something that was missing or something that was there? Uh, 
I think the amount yeah. of flight deck that is gone is quite surprising. Go ahead, Shoreside. Yeah, a, a question for the ship. Um, you know, as we complete this transit across the now um, ending flight deck, what, what's the next? What's the next move? Or is there going to be another transit reciprocally heading forward, or? Yeah. So the plan is to continue up. Um towards the stern and then there was um, some kind of debris field the team had identified they wanted to look at. Yeah, it looks like the majority of the debris in the sonar scan is, is off the starboard side and maybe 60, 70 meters out where it begins. We'll want to make our way back there and do some passes. It'll take a little time to get over there, um, but that's the plan as, as Mike laid out. Okay. Yeah, we, we didn't have we didn't have much focus there. You know, you could certainly see it in the sector and you know see it visually. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there. So yeah, that's a great plan. Just curious. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, if you got a minute to chat, I'll bring you the picture and it'd be easier to show you. And we had a question about photos. Uh, so um, I don't think there are photos of um, Akagi yet, but stay tuned on the Nautilus Live uh, social pages, our Instagram and other social media outlets uh, and um, photos and other highlights like reels may be posted uh, showing the uh, major um, images we got from this dive um, coming up in the next few days. You can also see the previous dive, the USS Yorktown highlight um, already posted.
And just to recap, um, as we move through this blue water, uh, we are currently in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument as part of the Ala Al Moana Kaiuli Expedition, meaning Path of the Deep Sea Traveler. This area has uh, many uh, levels of sacredness and uh, biological and cultural heritage. Um, and for this particular dive, we are examining the Akagi, which was uh, one of four aircraft carriers, uh, Japanese aircraft carriers that were sank in the area during the Battle of Midway. Uh, Akagi sustained significant damage from a 1,000 pound bomb that hit the, um, uh, the aft edge of the middle airplane elevator and penetrated through the flight deck to the upper hangar and due to other um, fully armed and fueled torpedo bombers being um, in the area, um, there was uh, a lot of um, fires ignited that continued to burn aboard uh, until the ship was purposely scuttled and sank. Um, since then, a team in 2019 uh, from Vulcan Inc. and the U.S. Navy did conduct a high-resolution mapping survey uh, via the research vessel Petrol and was able to uh, find the upright and intact uh, C4 target believed to be at Akagi at that time. And then um, now we are doing the first visual surveys, um, gathering more details of um, the current state of the shipwreck, um, finding out more about the damage that occurred um, and uh, helping to inform uh, historians of potential uh, more details about the battle and also honoring and memorializing this very historic site. So thank you for tuning in. Um, feel free to uh, ask questions on our uh, page nautiluslive.org and we'll try to get to them when we can. Thank you. That's interesting. Looks like we've drifted off. That's just the uh, starboard stern there. Yeah, looks like we're over on the side. Yeah. But thank you for coming down. As it's, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're comfortable. Yeah, you want to. Uh, yeah. You want to move back to the center, yeah. or you want to keep going on the? Well, I, I do want to be on the center, but I. Uh, I also want to continue down to the stern. So if we can get back to center, we'll finish off the run. I'm wondering if that's one of the pillar supports for the missing flight deck that would have been above us. Yeah, it was some of the lighter supports, uh, at least according to the plans. And we think also we saw like uh, the plan showed like a Carly float or something attached sure. to that lattice structure. It's connected to both of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna if it sounds if it's good with you, I'm gonna call into the bridge to do a one zero meter move at zero six zero to get us back on the center. Thank you. Alrighty, so I just called that in and we're getting pretty close towards the stern here. I'd say we're about 50 meters away. 
Hans, uh, we have been seeing uh, extensive damage on this ship. So, and as you have been telling us that it was struck by a thousand pound bomb and it was on fire for a long time. So do we know that given the damage that we are seeing on the wreck, how much of it is from the attack and the fire and how much of it is from sinking through the water column and being at the bottom of the seafloor for the last 80 years? Do we have records of that or no, it's, a, it's too difficult to ascertain that? Yeah, well, uh, you're right to point out that those are all different processes, different processes of scrambling what we see here in different positions and removing big pieces of what we don't see here. And it's hard to say where the, the boundaries are between those processes. It really is. Um, but you're right. Some is battle damage, subsequent fire damage, induced explosions, then the scuttling, then the fall through the water column, then the impact with the seafloor, and then the slow deterioration over time. All of those things have slightly different influences and results on the site as we see it today. Yep, absolutely. You are now halfway through the intro class to maritime archaeology site formation process. Yes, it has been a learning experience for me. That's for sure. Speaking of intro maritime archaeology courses, I I was able to take a a course that was offered via Zoom during COVID. And my background isn't in maritime archeology, span but um, that course made me uh, very interested in it. And I was able to use what I learned to go down to the Library of Congress and search for things. And um, I got, I was very excited to work with the, all the archeological experts on this team. Um, Can we zoom there please? Yeah, please continue. Yeah, so. It was a good course? Yeah, it was a great course. It was offered with the Maritime Archaeological Historic Society. They're based in Maryland. MAHS is their M-A-H-S. Um, so it was, it was great. Yeah, great introduction. And as a geographer, I love the intersection of human geography, physical geography, the, this, you know, the tools like GIS. Um, and I feel like it really envelops all those things as you search and then tell the work to tell the story as you do that historical research. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for the Zoom. You can go wide. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mia. You said you took it over Zoom. Was that because of the pandemic or is it just an online course that people can um, join in? So into. it was because of the pandemic. It was taught by um, Stephen Anthony from Moz and John Seidel from Washington College. Um, I actually worked with John when I, I was working in the GIS lab and he had talked about wanting to start that course and I was interested in it after getting into scuba diving and then I, I left that position. Um, and then they just so happened to have it completed and offered it online. I, I'm not sure if they still have it offered online, but for those interested, you can check it out. It's uh, MAHS, the Maritime Archaeological Historical Society. Um, and it was, yeah, just a really great opportunity to, to learn about this discipline that seemed really, um, maybe I didn't think it was something approach. If I felt like it wasn't something I could could do it seemed like a lot and I learned quite a bit and uh, I was really really excited when I learned that this trip was going to Midway as Hans knows I think he got many emails from me and many documents that I sent to the team <laughs> wow that's awesome thanks for sharing that uh, uh, maybe any of our viewers who are interested in uh, learning more about this field can uh, look into that resource I heard there's a super cool professor named Von Tilbert or something. I want to take his class. I would advise against it. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
This really is swept pretty clean back here. That's amazing. And we had uh, another question in the chat. Was the Battle of Midway the only battle this ship Akagi was involved in during the war? And I believe, um, Hans, you mentioned earlier that, uh, or one of our historian or archeologists mentioned earlier that um, it was actually also involved in Pearl Harbor and potentially other battles. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, Hans? Uh, I think June Kimura, our colleague in Japan, mentioned a number of important battles that this ship was involved in. Uh, of course, Pearl Harbor, and I, I believe the Coral Sea as well, but June mentioned several others, so this was... No, she was know. not a Coral Sea. Oh, um, sorry. She, uh, she took part at the... She was the flagship of the Pearl Harbor raid, and then after the Pearl Harbor raid, she led a uh, attack into the Indian Ocean against the British fleet. Um, when they returned from that, uh, they prepared for Midway. Uh, Shokaku and Zuikaku were the two Japanese carriers that were detached from the Kido Butai and sent to support the Coral Sea operation. Um, while we're while I'm on the on the line here, I'm looking at the that. Uh, unknown circular object at the top of the screen and we, we came across that when we were going around the um, the the hull uh, at the at the at the on the sides. Is it could you zoom in on that? Zoom please. Yeah Roger uh, we'll try and position the ROV over it a little bit closer to get a good zoom yeah. on it. Yeah, thank you, Shore Team, for the assist with the history of Akagi. Much appreciated. Yeah, it's interesting to note that when the Kido Butai set sail for the Midway operation, they were actually sailing at their lowest strength since the war began. And there were normally six carriers as part of it. Um, but because of uh, the Coral Sea operation and damage that Shikaku and Zuikaku received, they were not able to participate in that battle. Hmm. And you also had the four other carriers had been in nearly continual combat operations since the, the war began. So you can imagine the, um, the attrition of, you know, man and machine, so to speak, uh, when they set sail for that operation. Uh, it was probably a very different uh, force that, that sailed from Pearl Harbor six months earlier. Thank you so much for sharing that. Just for the rest of the team to know, um, I just put in another move of one zero meters and a bearing of zero nine zero. So Dan's able to orient uh, Atalanta at a better position to look at that circular object. 
Perfect, thank you. In theory. And adding on to that question of the lives lost earlier, um, just a note from a scientist ashore uh, previously uh, mentioned in a, one of the previous watches. Um, there's an amazing Japanese book by a woman named Sawachi Hisai that has the name, rank, birth, province, and age at time of death of every one of the 3,057 Japanese who perished during the battle and all of the Americans as well. So it's, an, uh, it's a really astonishing piece of research that um, you may want to check out. Do you know if that's been translated? I'm not sure, yeah. I haven't looked at the uh, book itself. It was just a, um, a resource that John had mentioned was out there. Yeah, I did find, um, I was trying to look for, for a list to honor both sides. Um, I found a, I think it was that book. And... Sorry, go ahead, Shor. The book was first, uh, the book was first published in June uh, 10th in this year, 2023, in Japanese version. So I think there's a translation, hasn't been done yet, but um, it's, it's a very um, tremendous work, and um, the, uh, one of the uh, characteristics of this book that there are also uh, results of the series of interviews um, on uh, and uh, Tawachi conducted in the uh, communication with um, a family member of U.S. Um, crews. So. Uh, it's an important book and for both, um, for two countries. Thank you. Thank you, June. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that is interesting, yes. And I'll definitely be on the lookout for a translated version of the book. Yeah, I think I have information Can on... Can we zoom there, please? On that, I have information on that book. So okay. I'll send it to you guys. Thanks, Mia, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That would be Lower great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mia, and thank you so much, June, for also adding the, those further details. Uh, please feel free to continue chiming in where you would, uh, whenever you would like. And um, since we uh, missed it during um, introductions earlier, would you like to introduce yourself, June? Um, thank you. Um, my name is June Kimura. Um, one of the uh, uh, Ashoa scientist members and I'm a ma underwater and maritime archaeologist, um, been, uh, been working in uh, uh, Dr. Tilburg and uh, Dr. Delgado before in a couple of projects. 
and uh, it's be honor to be uh, to join this um, expeditions. And thank you for uh, all your hard work and contribution. Thank you. Uh, earlier, Mia had asked a question to Hans about, you know, we've been exploring this wreck for several hours now, and she asked him if there was anything particularly um, striking or something that he wasn't expecting or the most interesting thing that uh, he learned from observing the wreck. Um, do you uh, have anything oh, thank you. to uh, add to that, June? What was the most um, revealing uh, observation from this uh, dive so far for you? Um, as a uh, few um, experts mentioned, um, this is um, the first time that visibly um, the Akagi uh, was confirmed. And um, uh, from archaeological um, site uh, survey and management of point of view, um, we can assess the physical conditions and uh, what remaining part, and uh, it's so important for the uh, reconstruction of the history of the actual battles. And um, um, uh, it's um, um, important part of uh, Pacific War histories, and um, the remaining conditions so far um, indicate um, that some um, historical um, record was actually quite light, and also some damage of the ships um, that I could see, and also um, some new information should never been that um, focused uh, came up from this expedition, such as the name of Agadi on on actual hull and uh, some side. Um, so thank you. Wow, thank you for sharing those insights. Um, do we? Team, do we have any comments on this circular structure? I'm sorry if I missed that earlier and the fan is kind of loud. So in general, sorry if I have missed any details that you said. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I we can tell you what that is. Sorry. Go ahead, Shore. Yeah, we were, we're looking at it. Um, at first, we thought it was probably a cap fan, but it looks like it's got cabling wrapped around inside it so I'm not we're not really sure what this is there's when you do the kaga dive you're going to see a very similar structure you know in this part of kaga as well um we're just kind of baffled by this too the drawings that we have you know it looks like uh the the stern anchor uh, chain was wrapped around it, but uh, with the cabling inside like that, I, I'm not sure anymore. This will involve more research. Dan, can we pan up and look down that hatch a bit if we can? Yeah, all right. <clears throat> Should be going uh, right over it here in a minute. Good. Can we zoom there? Okay, go ahead, Janet. Looking at it from this perspective, you know, we noted this open hatch earlier. Um, what Phil just noted was it looks like this hatch has been blown downward as opposed to opening upward. That was something that we couldn't tell from the earlier view of this. Yeah, it does look like the combing on that side of the hinges is kind of 
bent inward. So. Yeah. And if you look at that little cylindrical thing to the right, that looks like a fan structure. I like wonder a, if that could be like a ventilator or something. Like a through deck vent? Or some sort of a, something for ventilation, maybe. Yeah. We didn't see this perspective I mean, this, from that last uh, time we went around it. This is kind of interesting. Looks like it's part of the thing that's been blown off of the the the, the combing. Yeah. That's a big. That's a big heavy piece of metal. It's a and it's a big hatch too with that peep door. I mean, yeah. I believe John said when he was on that. Uh, you know this. We could probably assume that there were damage control parties trying to unjam the rudder, and this was probably where they were accessing. It's been blown off the hinges altogether. Wow. It's a great look. Thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. I wish we had a light that's going to go in there. I know. Well, I've never seen a hatch pushed in like that. I'm sorry, it got very hot. So you said you thought you saw another hatch in there. Well, there's that peep door on the hatch door. Yeah. So that peep door would have provided access for one human body at a time. It gives you some sense of scale of how large that opening actually is. Okay, if you go wait for me, to thank you. Head here, and see what we're. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for doing that. My pleasure. Stern there. Uh, let's see, uh, zero three zero. 
Zero two five, something like that. Uh, again, sorry if I missed this because it's a little hard to uh, hear no, the control the van. Ten meters, uh, zero two five. Sure. Um, we have multiple comments asking if increasing pressure due to the water as the ship sank could have possibly caused what we're seeing with this hatch where it's um, kind of it's kind of blown the hatch inward. Um, is that possible? Perhaps, but you know, I think this was an open deck area. Um, if that was a sealed compartment, in the transom, in the fantail, and you have increasing water pressure on the outside, perhaps. Thanks for answering that. We had uh, multiple viewers curious about that. That's a good suggestion. Where were the... Uh when they flooded the magazine decks uh, to fight when they were fighting the, the blaze, what decks were those? What part of the ship was flooded when they made that decision? Oh, I'd have to leave that to the experts on the shoreside team. My only guess would be it would be beneath the hangar decks in, in proximity, but um, shoreside? Do we know the position of the magazines that were flooded? No, I'm sorry, we do not. You know, we're kind of uh, hampered a little bit because uh, we don't really have any of the ship's detailed plans. Yeah. Uh, we just have the stuff that, you know, modelers have put together, uh, but a lot of the internal structure layout is, is still unknown to most of us. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd imagine it'd be deep within the ship for protection, but in proximity to lifts well, and, and one hangar decks. The, one the, yeah, one of the design faults on on the on Kaga and Akagi was that you know when they were originally designed, of course they weren't designed to be aircraft carriers, and so when you